So as I've mentioned the last couple of weeks, we started a Facebook group for, for, for you dough rollers, a place to hang out and share, you know, tips and resources and tools and whatnot. And it's been uh, a very vibrant, very active Facebook group. I'm uh, uh, thrilled that the, for the folks that have joined. We've got 150 members. If you haven't joined, you can go to doughroller.net slash Facebook. Join. We'd love to have you. In the Facebook group, uh, one of the folks that's there, Matthew, he had the following comment. He said, Rob, how about a podcast on income investing? Growth stocks are fine if you want to retire in 20 or 30 years, but aren't ideal if you want more near-term income to provide for your lifestyle. And my response was, great idea. I should warn you that my ideas on income investing are not conventional. That being said, I'll add it to the schedule. Well, I, I, that's exactly what I've done. Today, we're going to talk about income investing, what it is, how I think about it, and um, how, wh in what ways it's good and in what ways maybe it's not uh, so good. So that's going to be our main topic of the day. Before we get to it, I did get another email uh, from a, a listener who said, you know, I've, I've seen where folks can support the podcast through a monthly contribution. Uh, is there any way to make a one-time contribution? And uh, that was a good question. The truth is there wasn't. And so I went in, this is all through PayPal, and I, I figured out a way so that you can, if you want to support the podcast, uh, but don't want to do it on a monthly basis, just a one-time uh, uh, contribution, you can do that. Both are available, both a one-time contribution and the monthly at doorroller.net slash support. And I appreciate all those that have supported the podcast. Not only that way, by the way, there's plenty of ways to support the show. You can leave a review on iTunes. You can join the Facebook group. You can send me uh, great questions and topics to cover you can tell your friends and family about the podcast. So I appreciate uh, everyone who supported the show in any uh, of those ways. So what we're going to do today, we've got this uh, income investing we're going to cover. I've got some great questions from listeners that have emailed me. I'm going to cover three of those. And then, of course, we've got the question of the week, both, both from last week, net worth. I'm going to share with you, not any names, but I'll give you some idea of, of the net worth of folks uh, that responded. I've already notified the winners, by the way, of the $25 Amazon gift card, four of them. Uh, so congrats to you guys, but we'll have another question of the week and another chance to win uh, one of four $25 Amazon gift cards. Before we get to all that, I want to cover one quick news item uh, that I found in the New York Times. And it was this, the title of it was Wall Street Ties Linger as Image Issue for Hillary Clinton. And the interesting aspect of this news item actually has nothing to do uh, with Hillary Clinton, uh, and it comes in the first two paragraphs. Let me read them to you. John uh, Wittenben simmered as he listened to Hillary Rodham Clinton defend her ties to Wall Street during last week's Democratic debate. He lost 40% of his savings in individual retirement accounts during the Great Recession, while Mrs. Clinton has received millions of dollars from the kinds of executives he believes should be in jail. Quote, people knew what they were doing back then because of greed, and it caused me harm, said Mr. Wittenben, the Democratic chairman in Emmett County, Iowa. We, are, we were raised a certain way here. Fairness is a big deal. That comment and quote really struck me because, uh, first of all, the Great Recession uh, impacted the stock market, as we all know, and any of us who were invested in the stock market, uh, the value of our investments went down significantly. That was true for all of us. It's got nothing to do with Hillary Clinton. It's got nothing to do with whatever money she's received from Wall Street, I guess through speeches and whatnot. It's got nothing to do with any of that, right? Um, and it doesn't even have anything to do with greed. Some could say, well, the whole banking crisis certainly brought down the value of the stock market. Sure, and, you know, you, you, could, you could blame Wall Street. You could also blame all of us who paid ridiculous amounts of money for homes we couldn't afford, right? I mean, I, I think we, we, we were part of the problem. Uh, you know, you could blame the government for facilitating these ridiculous loans. Um, but the reality is, if we're historians at all, we know that the stock market goes up and down. And there's always a different reason for uh, a boom or bust. Uh, but 2008 and 9 and 10... Uh, you know, the market, I guess it bottomed in 09. Um, that's what markets do. It's not the first time. It's certainly not going to be the last time. And uh, if you're going to invest, you got to, we got to appreciate that that's going to happen. And the best thing, and I don't know what this fella did, I, I almost kind of sounds like he sold his investments. Because if, if he hadn't sold his investments, he still wouldn't be simmering. He'd be thrilled because they've, they've gone up now 
far more than they lost. And by the way, they could go back down. That's just the nature of, 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 of investing. Uh, but as I read that, it struck me. I thought, you know, if he really does blame Hillary Clinton, it sounds like he does, he's missing the point, and he's missing the opportunity to really learn about investing and how the markets work. And I hope, and of course, I don't know this guy, but I hope he stayed in the market, and I hope he stuck to his investing uh, plan. And if he did, he's doing great now. Uh, but it's something to keep in mind because right now the market is reasonably good. You know, there's always th things out there that kind of scare us and, you know, Europe and uh, terrorism and all these other things. Um, you know, the, the, the strength of the U.S. dollar, our interest rates are going to start going up. Um, you know, why did Ohio State Buckeyes lose yesterday to Michigan State? You know, th those kinds of things that just gnaw at you. Um, anyway. They're going to happen again. We need to prepare for them now. It's in the good times that we need to be prepared for that 40% drop because it will happen. And it's not going to be Hillary Clinton's fault or Republicans' fault. You know, it's just not. I mean, that's just what the market does. And uh, okay, there you go. All right, on to the main topic, income investing. So when we talk about income investing, some some refer to it as dividend investing. What are we, what are we talking about? So when you think about an investment, and this is true for stocks and bonds. Um, income will be the interest from a bond or dividends from a stock that a company pays out. That's considered uh, income. You get that paid out. You know, you don't have to sell any shares of your stock or mutual fund. Uh, you still own all of the, the, the shares that you owned before. But the company takes some of its earnings and pays out a dividend. If, if, you're, if you own the individual stock, it'll come directly to you. If it's part of a mutual fund, it gets paid to the mutual fund. And the mutual fund company then periodically distributes those dividends to uh, to the shareholders. And same is true with the bond fund. We're going to kind of focus on stocks uh, for, for, for this podcast, but uh, certainly with, with bonds, you get paid interest. And then, of course, there's also appreciation. Hopefully, the investments go up in value. By the way, bonds can go up in value too, particularly when interest rates go down. We've talked about that before. But in the case of stocks, which we'll focus on, you know, we kind of hope that the companies uh, do well. Uh, any earnings that they retain, we hope that they allocate that capital wisely and continue to improve uh, their business and that the value of our investments uh, will will go up. But when people talk about income investing, again, we're going to stick with stocks for our, for our purposes today. They're talking about dividends. And the idea is to pick stocks that pay high dividends. Now, what would that look like? What, what, what in a dividend yield you know, would be considered good today? Well, as a starting point, we could go to um, we could go to uh, the um, uh, S and P 500. Right now, if you look at the S and P, even the a Vanguard S and P 500 index fund, it's it's TTM yield, trailing 12 month yield, is just over two percent, like 2.03 percent, something like that. So, in other words, for every hundred thousand uh, dollars you have invested, say in the S and P 500 over the last 12 months, you would have received about $2,000 in dividends, right? Now, some would say, yeah, that's sort of average, but if for an income investor, for someone focused on, on the income side of things, you would want uh, yields higher than that, right? So where could you find uh, uh, yields through stock investments higher than 2%? Well, there's a couple of, of places you could go. One would be uh, REITs. REITs, you know, real estate investment trusts tend to have higher yields. They have to pay out 90, at least 90% of their income, um, and they tend to have high yields. I'm looking now on Morningstar at Realty Income Corp. It is a REIT. Its ticker is O. I love that. One, one letter ticker, O. Uh, a very if, Among real estate investors, among REIT investors, Realty Income is a very well-known, very popular um, REIT with really a phenomenal history. Um, I've never invested in it individually, although I'm sure in my REIT mutual funds. They have shares of, of this REIT. But in any event, I'm looking at it on Morningstar, and its yield, 4.56%. So it's more than twice the yield uh, of the S&P 500. That would be one example of REIT. Um, you know, in, even in like energy, you know, now energy has taken a beating, um, in part because of uh, the, the falling um, commodity prices, right? Oil's been down, everyone knows. Uh, but take a look at ExxonMobil. Very obviously, everyone's heard of ExxonMobil, well-known company, solid history. It's got a yield of 3.61%, uh, a very high high yield. Um, what else can we look at? Um, how about the telecom? They tend to have high yields. 
So let me look up, uh, let's see here. How about AT&T? That's usually uh, a good one. And of course, here we go. Actually, I'm going to look up Verizon because I used to own Verizon stock. Um, yield, 4.88%. So there's a, a company uh, with uh, a yield that's obviously more than twice what the S&P uh, 500 is paying. Why does a company like Exxon or Verizon, why do they have high yields? Well, uh, you know, they're, they're, um, they're not the, the high-flying companies, right? They're, they're not the Teslas with sky-high uh, uh, valuation or sky-high prices relative to the earnings or, or an Amazon, for example. And they, they're companies that generate a lot of cash. And so they have the cash to pay, to pay the, uh, the, the, uh, the high dividends. And so you get a, a high yield, 4.88%. Those are just a few examples. You could also find mutual funds that focus on higher yielding uh, in investments that would have yields higher than, say, a tip in the average. In this case, I use the S&P 500 as the average. Uh, you might pick other another index, but you know, in this case, two percent maybe is the average. So you, you, you have plenty of ways to find investments uh, with um, higher yields. Now the question is, is that a good strategy even for retirees? And at first blush, it seems like a great strategy. And the the, the thinking is this. If I can get a yield high enough so that I can live off that yield, certainly if I could get yields at 4%, that's sort of the rule of thumb for, for withdrawal, withdraw, withdrawal rate. So I can just live off the yield. And it, it gives us a great deal of comfort because the thinking is we don't have to sell any of our shares. We still own the same sh number of shares uh, in the mutual fund uh, or in, 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 the, in an individual stock or whatever. We can live off the yield. We don't have to sell any of our investments. It, 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 it makes us feel secure. And I can understand that. My goal today is to, to convince you that it shouldn't make us feel secure. Now, my point today is not that dividends are bad. In fact, I think they're very good. And I'm going to end this topic on why I think they're very good. But they shouldn't give us a feeling of, of comfort uh, that we're, say, living off the yield and not selling uh, the shares. And I want to. My goal is to convince you of that. And um, so here we go. And you can you can email me or leave a comment on the Facebook group as to whether I've convinced you of that or not. The second thing I want to convince you of is because of that, among other things, an investment strategy that focuses too heavily on the dividend yield, even if you're in retirement or nearing retirement, is a bad investment strategy. Okay. Those are my two goals. Two goals for today. You'll tell me if I've uh, if I've if I've accomplished them or not. The first thing that I want to talk about uh, then is what happens when a company pays a dividend? How exactly does that work? Well, here's what happens. The board of directors get together and they decide, they set what the dividend is going to be. And they do this every quarter. It usually stays the same except for one quarter uh, each year. If the company's doing well, they'll raise uh, the dividend. If, if it's doing well, of course, sometimes they lower it. Uh, but once they set the dividend uh, uh, for uh, the year, it tends to stay that amount for the, the rest of that uh, fiscal year. It doesn't have to. There's no rule that says they can't change it every uh, quarter. There, you know, so they could certainly change it, uh, not pay it one quarter, you know, pay it more often, less often. Uh, you know, it's up to them. But that's sort of typically what happens. The board of directors meet and uh, they set the dividend. You know, we're going to pay whatever, um, 25 cents a share in dividends, cash dividends uh, to, to shareholders uh, who, who own shares of our company on the record date. That's what they call it. And they, they set that date sometime in the future. So if you own shares on the record date, you get the dividend. Um, that's true, by the way, if you bought the shares uh, just a few days earlier, and we're going to talk about that. Um, and it's also true if you sell your shares the day after, even before the dividend's actually been paid. And if you think about it, it kind of has to be that way, because particularly for larger companies, you know, millions of shares trade hands every day. And so it's, it's a, you can imagine it's a bit of a logistical nightmare to figure out, wait a minute, who, who's supposed to get these millions of, of dividend checks uh, that go out each quarter? We need a way to figure this out. So that's what they do. They set the record date. Uh, you got to own the shares as of this record date. But as you might imagine, even though you can get on the line and you can, in just a couple of mouse clicks, buy or sell stock, very easy, um, there's a couple of days for it to actually settle for the shares to actually get to you, or if you're selling to get to the buyer, uh, that doesn't happen instantaneously. So uh, what they do is they've come up with what is called the ex-dividend date. 
and the ex-dividend date is two trading days before the record date. Now, by the way, don't worry about keeping all these dates in your head. I know it gets a little complicated, but the ex-dividend date is two trading days before the record date. And here's the rule. You have to have bought the stock before the ex-dividend date to be considered the, 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 the record holder, the holder of that share on the record date for the next dividend payment. If you buy the stock on the ex-dividend date, it's too late for that next dividend payment. Of course, you know, you wait another quarter. If you still own the stock, you'll get the, you'll start pick, collecting the dividends then. But as for the, the current dividend that the board of directors has declared, you've got to have purchased that, that, that your shares before the ex-dividend date. Not on the ex-dividend date, before. One day before is fine. There's no rule other than that. If you, you buy at the last few seconds of the trading day before the ex-dividend date, you're good. If you buy the morning of the ex-dividend date, it's too late. You're going to have to wait a quarter for the next dividend payment. Now, um, that gets people to thinking, well, wait a minute here. I got an idea. Why don't I buy whatever, $100,000 of Apple, right, on, right before this market closes, the day before the ex-dividend date, um, wait, you know, one day, I now am, am going to collect the dividend and then sell the stock. I can even sell it before the dividend's actually paid. I'm going to get the dividend. The buyer of my stock is not. They're going to have to wait a quarter. Yeah, there's some risk. Maybe the, the price goes up or down in that day that I own it, but yeah, I'm willing to take that risk and I'm going to collect a big fat dividend check. Well, why not do that? And, and, you know, I can trade for four bucks a trade. So yeah, there's some transaction costs, but that's nothing compared to, you know, a good, a good dividend yield for owning the stock for one day. Well, uh, that, that kind of strategy, there's actually a name for it, dividend capture strategy. Um, and it doesn't work. It's a, it's a, it's a stupid strategy. And you say, well, I don't, I don't get it. It seems like a great strategy. Well, here's the problem. Let's imagine a stock. Um, you're going to buy a thousand dollars of, of a company and it's trading at 10 bucks a share. And you're going to buy it the day before the ex-dividend date because they've declared a dividend of two bucks a share. It's like, wow, that's terrific. Um, so you buy the stock uh, the day before the ex-dividend date, you pay a thousand dollars. You're looking good. You, you know, you're a little nervous that night. You're wondering what's going on after hours, but you wake up the next morning on the ex-dividend date and you're ready to sell because you've got, you've, you've owned it when you need to own it. You're going to get that dividend. And uh, you know, no news, company, nothing's changed, everything's good, and you go in the, the first thing on the, the, when the market opens and you go to sell, and, and you don't own $1,000 in stock anymore. You own 800 And you think, uh, wait a minute, what just happened? Well, remember, it declared a, a dividend of, of $2 a share. We're going to assume it's trading at 10 bucks a share. You own $1,000. What they do on the ex-dividend date is they, su they subtract the dividend from the, 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 the price and it, that's what it opens at. So if it's if it if it if it traded at ten bucks a share the day before the ex dividend date, and they pay they they've declared a two dollar dividend on the ex dividend date when it opens up the next morning, it's now magically trading at eight dollars. So congratulations, you now own eight hundred dollars worth of stock, and you're entitled to two hundred dollars in dividends. Your initial investment of a thousand dollars is still worth just a thousand dollars minus the transaction costs and the tax you'll likely pay on the dividend that you've just, or that you will receive shortly in the amount of $200. Yeah, see, Wall Street and the companies, they figured out this whole dividend capture thing. And yeah, it doesn't quite work. Now, you may not have seen that. This may be news to some of you because I've kind of given an extreme example of, of a $10 stock paying a $2 dividend. That doesn't really happen. Uh, there are some exceptions, but generally that doesn't happen. The dividend is a relatively small fraction of the share price. And, you know, the S&P 500, as I mentioned, it's 2% average dividend. Uh, and so, you know, it, it declares a, a dividend, maybe pays a, a quarter or 50 cents. And sure, the, the, the price opens up on the ex-dividend date down that amount, but then it immediately starts trading. Millions of shares are trading hands. The price is going up and down for a gazillion different reasons. We don't really see that. And, you know, even if we're looking for it, you might not see it. But it's an important concept to understand. Remember, there is no free lunch. There isn't. And so this dividend, it's not just free money. The company is actually, you know, paying out cash that used to be in its bank account, used to be on its balance sheet, cash that it could have reinvested in the company. And it's decided, no, we're going to give it back to shareholders. But that comes as a price and it, it comes at a price and it lowers the price of, uh, of the stock. Even if, you know, a moment later, uh, the price is moving again for a gazillion different reasons. 
Uh, It's an important concept uh, to understand when we think about dividend investing and what happens when a dividend is paid. When a company pays that dividend, that's just money it does not have to reinvest uh, in its company. Now, fine. You might say, okay, I get that, Rob, but still, I still own the same number of shares, right? Right. And they're still in the market. Hopefully, the company continues to do well and the price goes up, right? Right. And I'm still going to be entitled to the next quarterly dividend, right? Right. And I've got my dividend. Yes. So you feel good. Well, let me give you some problems with income investing. Let me give you some, some, some drawbacks to relying on dividends for retirement income. You ready? Number one, you don't control the amount. The board of directors does. You can't call them up and say, hey, you know, I got a, my furnace went out. Can you up the dividend this quarter? I need a little extra cash. Doesn't work that way. You have zero control over the amount of the dividend. Now, I suppose you could say, well, but I can pick my investments uh, based on the yield and whatnot. Sure, you can. Uh, but of course, the, the dividends can always come down. In 08, auto industry dividends went to zero. Banking dividends went to zero. In the energy crisis we're having now, some companies' dividends are going down. Not all of them. Uh, but you know, dividends are not a guarantee. Uh, but regardless, you do not control the amount of the payments. That's the first problem. Number two, you don't control the timing, right? Um, they're going to come out typically every quarter, so they're predictable, and that's going to be a good thing. But what if one year you say, you know what, I, I, actually, I don't need any money this year, and I'd rather not you know, pay the taxes on it. Can you hold off on a dividend? They're not going to do that for you, right? The, the company has a dividend policy, and it's got a lot of shareholders. Uh, or in the case of mutual funds, you're even, even more removed uh, from the investment. You can't control uh, the timing. The timing is whatever it is, typically quarterly, and you have no control over that. By the way, if you were to sell shares of an investment, to fund um, your retirement, you would have control over both, right? You would choose the amount and you would choose the timing. You don't have that control over dividends. Third problem, taxes. Now, in in, in a retirement account, as you're saving for retirement, obviously there there are no tax implications when dividends are paid. Uh, Certainly in a taxable account, they are. Um, And so this may be more relevant to folks with your taxable investments. But when a dividend is paid, normally for most people, there are all kinds of exceptions, and I'm not a tax expert, but normally uh, if it's a qualified dividend, you're going to pay capital gains tax. But here's the thing. You're going to pay it on 100% of the dividend, all of it, right? Um, If you sell a share, you're not going to pay taxes. Again, we'll assume it's going to be long-term capital gains if you've held the investment for more than a year. You're not going to pay taxes, although on on typically 100% of the sale amount. Some of that's going to be your basis, what you paid for the stock. Now, you know, if you've owned shares for a really long time, it may be the case that the vast majority of that money will be taxable. Uh, I imagine if Warren Buffett decides to sell the share of Berkshire Hathaway, the vast majority of that is going to be taxed. Uh, But uh, for many of us, depending on your investment, um, you you know, a large part of that sale will be um, part of your basis, what you paid for the stock. And so it won't, it, it won't be taxed. And you would have control over which investments you sell. And you might choose to sell certain investments that either do trigger a lot of taxes if you know, other income that year is lower, and you might benefit from that, or uh, investments that won't generate uh, as much tax. You're trying to keep your tax bill lower uh, that year. But the point is, uh, with dividends, you don't have any say in it, no control uh, with selling of shares you have uh, all the control. All right. Um, The fourth thing that troubles me with income investing or this concept of too much emphasis on the dividend yield when we make our investment decisions is that it assumes that selling shares is a bad thing. It assumes that we're sort of giving up something in a way that with a dividend, we're not giving it up. And I think, and I certainly understand why it feels that way, but I think it's a big, big uh, mistake. And um, the, I think the best explanation of this concept uh, is in uh, a letter that Warren Buffett wrote to uh, the Berkshire, Berkshire uh, investors, shareholder letter. He writes it every year, and it's a phenomenal um, letter. You should read it every single year, whether you invest uh, in Berkshire, as I do, uh, and I've been to his meetings now twice, uh, or not. Even if you don't, these are publicly available. And... Uh, in, it, was, it was the 2012 letter 
for fiscal year 2012, which means it came out in early 2013. He, in this letter, he addresses some shareholders who have complained that Berkshire Hathaway doesn't pay a dividend. And they point out that, hey, uh, Warren, Berkshire invests in dividend-paying stocks like Wells Fargo and IBM and American Express and General Motors. You, you love dividend-paying stocks, yet you're stingy with the Berkshire dividends. We want, we want dividends too. We like dividends as much as you do. Hey, how about coughing some up? And he addresses that issue in his letter in a, in a way far better than I ever could. Uh, and uh, it's a must read. It really is a must read. And the thing I like about the letter and his, the way he addresses this is it's so, you, you come away from it thinking, man, I'm really smart now. I'm a lot smarter uh, than before I read his letter. He just has a way of communicating uh, and explaining, you know, fairly complicated financial topics that you just come away and think, man, I got it. I got it. And I'm not going to go into the details. He uses a lot of numbers. What I am going to do is leave a link uh, to this letter in the Facebook group. So again, you can just go to doorler.net slash Facebook. It'll redirect you to the group. Join it if you haven't. I'll leave a link in. It's just easier. It's one of the reasons I started the group, as you know. Um, uh, but he talks about these issues. He talks about, you, you know, you don't have control of timing. You don't have control of the am amount. Um, you don't, you know, the, the tax implications. Um, the other thing he points out is that most companies trade at a multiple of their book value, right? I'm looking at Verizon. It trades at a, a book, price to book 14.1. Um, he talks about that. So that selling shares, you're basically getting, as compared to book value at the moment, a huge boost over the, the net worth uh, of the company as reported uh, in its financial statement, something you don't do with a dividend, which is just basically funneling cash from the company, you know, right out of the coffers and into investors' hands. Oftentimes, by the way, particularly before we retire, it's just getting turned around and reinvested in the company. If you're in a taxable account, uh, it's after you pay taxes. So I highly recommend this letter. Uh, and one of the things he points out, though, that I will mention is this. He's been giving away his his stake in Berkshire for a number of years. He gives away... I think it's four and a half percent a year, he said. I'm actually uh, going through the, the letter now. I think it's um, four and a half percent. And he's been doing that. Yeah, no, excuse me, four and a quarter. It's four and a quarter percent. I'm on uh, page 21 of his, his, his 2012 letter. He gives away four and a quarter percent, which, you know, he owns his original position when he started doing this. He owned 712 million, 497,000 B equivalent shares split adjusted. Unbelievable. Uh, that's a lot, by the way. Okay, so he's been giving away four and a quarter percent. As a result, he owns fewer shares. He doesn't own as many shares. That's kind of the, the thing that we fear, right? Oh, no, I don't want to sell my shares. I'll own fewer shares. He owns a lot less. He's gone from 712 million to just, well, I say just, to only 528 million. That's eh, still a lot, but, you know, that's almost 200 million shares fewer that he owns today than he did. I think this goes back to 2000, I want to say five, when he started doing this. All right. So uh, in a sense, he's just he's done the thing that retirees fear. You've, you've given up all of these shares. What were you doing? Come on. I thought you were a good investor. Well, he points out that in 2005, the 712 million shares he owned was worth 28 billion. That's with a B, 28 billion, 28.2 billion for those keeping score at home. He's now got almost 200 million shares fewer, 528 million. But in 2012, when he wrote this letter, his stake has gone from 28 billion in 05 up to 40 billion uh, in 2012. Why? Because the company has reinvested the money uh, wisely, of course, under the leadership of Warren Buffett. And as a result, uh, the value of his investment has gone up considerably. So I, I really want, I hope, again, my goal was to convince you that there's no free lunch. Just because you're getting dividends and not selling your shares. Uh, doesn't mean you're not giving something up. You absolutely are. M remember, before you retire, you, you were reinvesting those dividends. In retirement, you're not. Taking the dividends and spending it, uh, I'm not saying that's a bad way to go, but don't, don't think for a minute you're getting a free lunch. You're not. And don't just assume that selling a share over a, di a dividend is bad. It's not, and it has, as I, we've talked about, a lot of advantages. Now, um, the, th the mistake that I see folks make is making investments because of the yield. 
I'm going to put all of my money in what I think are high yielding investments, let's say 4% or higher, because I want that dividend income to live on. And what they're ignoring is the total return, the return from the appreciation uh, of the underlying value of the company plus the dividend. And here's the thing. As yields go up, typically, and there's always exceptions, but higher yielding stocks tend to generally go up in value at a slower pace. Why? Because there are older companies like um, utilities, communications companies. Um, these are you know, certainly good companies, but they're not fast growing. Um, one of the reasons their yield is so high is because they don't have productive ways to use the capital. So all they can do is give it back to you, right? And so when you focus just on the yield at the exclusion of underlying appreciation, to the exclusion of the total return, I think you're doing yourself a disservice. Now, all of that said, and I promised I'd get back to why I love dividends, all of the stocks that I own pay a dividend other than Berkshire Hathaway. Um, I own IBM, pays a dividend. I own Deere, pays a dividend. Apple uh, pays a dividend. Ford pays a dividend. Why do I like dividend-paying stocks? couple of reasons. One, uh, it usually shows that management is focused on the shareholder. When, when, when a company is, is paying a dividend, you know, they, 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 when, they, when they go to spend money, when they go to allocate their capital, they've got to keep that in the back of their minds. Wait a minute, we've got a dividend to pay. We can't just, you know, on a whim, just go use this money however we want to. We have shareholders to answer to. It's one of, the, it's one of my complaints about Google. Um, you know, Google uh, has a lot of cash. They should be paying a dividend. And they're not. And I think, you know, it makes me question their use of capital. And they, they've, they've started and shut down project after project after project. And I think paying a dividend would instill some discipline in management uh, that would be very useful and a, a shareholder-minded uh, attitude that I think would be useful. So one of the reasons I like dividends is that it, it shows that management uh, is focused on shareholder and shareholder value. That's the first thing. The second thing is, it usually shows a stable, mature company, which are the kinds of companies that I like to invest in. Stable, mature companies that I think uh, are, are undervalued. That's really what's important to me. It just so happens that most companies that fit into that mold pay a dividend, right? Uh, and so uh, that's the second thing. The third thing I like about dividends is that, uh, except in extreme cases, and we saw that with the 2008 Great Recession, except in those extreme cases, Dividends can often continue even when the, the value of the underlying stock goes down. And so you may be in a situation where you still need that income. Uh, the, the price has gone way down. You don't want to sell. Uh, maybe you still believe in the company uh, or the index or, or you know, wh whatever your investment approach is. Uh, you don't want to sell, uh, but you need, you need retirement income. And so it's still paying a dividend. And so you can continue to uh, cash those dividend checks without selling stocks at what you think is a depressed uh, uh, value. So I, I, I love dividend paying companies. I think companies that pay a dividend, very, very good. However, and I guess really the main point that I wanted to focus on today is, I think we can get too carried away with focusing on the yield and the dividend. What we should always be focused on is the underlying company. Uh, is it a solid company? Is it competitive? Uh, does it have a solid brand? Does it have good management doing smart things with the capital, including dividends, including repurchases when the stock is undervalued, including smart acquisitions, not acquisitions that, that, that um, raid the company's stock and dilute our shares, uh, not, not silly overpriced acquisitions, but smart uses of capital. That's what I'm looking for. And those companies, again, tend to pay a dividend. So the point today is not that dividends are bad. And not even that relying to some extent on dividends in retirement is bad, but I think we can get too focused on it and too carried away with it. And there's a lot of advantages to generating a good portion of retirement income, not from dividends, but from actually selling shares. Again, you have the control over the timing, you have control over the amount, uh, depending on where your investments are, you can have tax benefits. So there you go. That's my take on dividend investing or income investing. I doubt it was what Matthew had expected. And I told him my, my views are somewhat unconventional. I, again, highly recommend that you check out um, the, um, the, the Berkshire Hathaway letter. I will leave a link to it uh, in the Facebook group. And in fact, I'm going to pause this podcast right now to drop that link in the Facebook group right now.
Okay, just uh, put that link up on Facebook. You got to read that letter. Excellent, excellent uh, description of dividends and kind of how to think about them. Okay, on to the questions of the week. The first one comes from Kim. She writes, I am looking to get a credit card to help with debt. Both my husband and I have credit scores of 806 and 813. What I want to know is what is the difference between APR and interest? If I get a zero APR for, say, 15 or 21 months, does that mean I do not have to make any payments until then? Thanks, Kim. Okay, great question. And balance transfer credit cards, 0% credit cards, uh, can be a little tricky to, to understand uh, if you haven't used them before. So APR, annual percentage rate, that really is the interest rate. That's annual percentage rate, is the interest rate expressed on an annual basis. That's all it is. So with the credit cards, they'll say something like a 0% introductory APR, and it, it will last for a certain period of time. As of today, this is in November of 2015, the longest uh, 0% uh, introductory APR available on a balance transfer is 21 months, uh, which is a pretty long time, just short of two years. So what that means is you transfer a $10,000 balance or whatever from an old card to, to a new new card with a different credit card company. It always has to be a different credit card company. You can't transfer, say, a balance from one Capital One credit card to another Capital One credit card or from one city to another city credit card or Discover to Discover. It doesn't work that way. you got to change credit card companies. Uh, you won't pay any interest. Uh, for whatever period of time. Citibank has several at 21 months. Uh, Discover has some at 18 months. Uh, one of the best offers is actually Chase Slate. It's only for 15 months, but it's the only one without a balance transfer fee. Normally you pay a fee of 3%. Still a good deal as compared to, say, paying 15, 20, 25% interest on a credit card. Uh, so, th you know, those are still good deals, but Ch Chase Slate has, has one. Uh, 0% for 15 months, no balance transfer fee. But here's the thing. You will be making payments each month. So you don't pay any interest, but you still have to make the minimum payment. Uh, typically, it's around 2% of the balance, but that's going to vary from uh, credit card company to credit card company. So if, that, if, 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 if you need to know the exact amount of the payment, how they calculate it, you want to reach out to each credit card company. But 2% roughly is pretty standard. But because it's 0% interest, all of your payment will go to the principal balance. All of it will go to the principal balance. And, um, and so obviously that's a good deal. So uh, yeah, so Kim, APR and interest, basically the same thing. APR is simply the, the interest expressed on an annual basis, right? You could divide that by 12 and express that on a monthly basis or 365 and, and express it on a daily basis. But the annual percentage rate uh, is um, the APR, annual percentage rate is the interest rate on an annual basis basis. You do have to make payments during the 0% period, but 100% of your payments go to the principal balance, none to the interest. So you get to see your, your debt go down faster and without paying any interest. So that's, that's question one. Question two, actually kind of related. This is from Stephanie. She says, on a different note, I'm a longtime listener and originally found your podcast when researching ways to get out of debt. I enjoy listening to your advice and it's helped me gain awareness and implement some control over my finances. Recently, I've been considering taking out a personal loan to consolidate my credit card debt. I have about $4,800 on two cards, both of which are 0% interest through April of next year. This debt has just been sitting on both cards while I snowball my lower balance debts. I realize that the point of the snowball method is to just tackle one debt at a time, but now those debts are nearing their payoff dates. The reason I'm considering a personal loan despite the interest, is because I would it would force me to pay down that debt and give me a set length of time to pay the debt off, rather than allow it to sit on the credit card indefinitely. I need help weighing the pros and cons of each. Do I, I like how she ended the, the email. Do I need to grow up and exercise some self-discipline with another 0% interest credit card, or is a personal loan a viable option? Thanks for your time and consideration. Well, that's a great question. It kind of, Stephanie's question kind of mixes math, right? Zero uh, percent is going to be better than a personal loan that charges interest. So it mixes math on the one hand with behavioral finance on the other. What motivates us? What compels us to do smart things with our money? And hey, yeah, I pay some interest, but if I lock in on say a personal loan uh, for some amount of time, let's say it's a three-year loan, for example, you know, it forces me if I'm going to make my minimum payments, it forces me to make them, and in three years the debt's gone or whatever time period it might be. What what should should I do? Well. 
as always, I don't think there's a single right answer that applies uh, to everyone. What we did, we continued to um, roll over 0% balances from one credit card to the next for about three or four years until we had it all paid off. Uh, and we would often take money from our home equity line of credit, roll that onto a 0% credit card uh, and continue to pay that off. So that's one of the reasons it took us longer. But my view was always, I want the 0%. So I was always focused on the math. I, I didn't need additional motivation for me uh, to get out of debt. And in fact, on that score, I was cleaning out my office and I found a piece of paper. I, I knew this existed, but I, 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 hadn't, I couldn't put my hands on it. It's a little notepad single sheet, and it's got June 15th, 2005 written on it with a big box drawn around it. And the next, I actually have the time, 6.31 p.m., June 15th, 2005, over 10 years ago. And on it, I say, I will be totally, and I've underlined the word totally, I will be totally debt-free by June 15th, 2012. And I remember writing this. I was in my shop uh, where I am now, sitting here recording this podcast. Before I started doughroller.net, the blog, obviously long before this podcast, and I was listening to a Dave Ramsey show. And all these crazy people are getting on there screaming that they're debt-free, and I just had had enough. And I said, that's it. I'm going to get out of debt. Now, the interesting thing is I failed. I was not totally debt-free by June 15th, 2012. But I think in many, many other ways, we've accomplished uh, not maybe this exact goal, uh, but pretty close. And now, basically, the only thing we have is our mortgage, and we could pay it off tomorrow if we wanted to. We just don't want to, at least not right now. But I love that note. Anyway, so, you know, Stephanie, I guess the point is I, I was where you are not that long ago. And uh, here, here's the first, I have a couple questions for you. Uh, I assume it, with a personal loan, your monthly payment will be a little higher than if you continue to just pay on the 0% interest credit cards, even if you roll them over to a new 0% credit card. As I mentioned in response to Kim's question, you do have to make minimum payments, usually 2% of the loan. Uh, so I assume if you, if you get a personal loan, um, your minimum payments will be higher. If you stick with the credit cards, they'll be lower. So here's my question. If you stick with the credit cards, what will you do with that extra money? What's the difference? And what will you do with it? If you say, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fund an IRA, or I'm going to fund a 401k, and I've got an employer match, that's what I'm going to do with that extra money if I keep my debt on 0% credit cards. Well, then my answer is keep it on the 0% credit cards because you're going to be doing really smart things with your money, uh, you're going to be saving for your retirement. You're not paying any interest. You know, maybe every year and a half or so, you pay a 3% fee to roll it over. Uh, but that's what I would do. I'd be maxing out those retirement accounts. That, that would, that's how I would handle the situation. On the other hand, if you said, well, Rob, I have no idea what I'm going to, I'm going to blow it. I don't know on what, but I'm just going to, it'll get spent. Uh, you know, I'm not going to save it. I'm not going to, you know, I'm going to just spend it on who knows what. Then I would say you should get the personal loan. I would, I would bite the bullet on the interest, assuming this is where you can, always, there's always exceptions. If you tell me the, the interest on the personal loan is 30%, then no, I'm probably not going to tell you to get a personal loan. But assuming you get a reasonable rate, say a single digit rate on a personal loan, which you certainly can do at Lending Club or Prosper if you have decent credit, um, I would, that's better in my mind than keeping it on a credit card and just blowing the difference. Uh, so that's, you know, that's my answer. It depends on what you're going to do with that extra money. Uh, in our case, we were maxing out retirement accounts. Uh, maxing out the 401k and even frankly saving beyond that. Uh, and that's just a smart thing to do. Now I know some would say, no, pay off all your debt. I don't care if it's 0% or not. That's your number one goal until it's all paid off. Don't do anything else. Don't worry about an employer match. Don't save for retirement, you know, nothing. And uh, yeah, I just, I, the, the math simply uh, it, it cannot support that approach to personal finance. It's simply incompatible with, with simple math and common sense, in my opinion. So, Stephanie, there you go. That's my answer. Depends what you'll do with that extra money. Do smart things with it. Stick with the 0% credit cards. Do dumb things with it. Get the personal loan, assuming the interest rates aren't astronomical. All right, last question from Aaron. Slowly catching up on your podcast, actually almost there, up to January now. Uh, it's interesting hearing you change from a do-it-yourself kind of guy to a more robo-advisor kind of guy. I've barely started and I already feel like that's the way to go. That makes me think it's a bad idea. Um, I was just wondering if you know a good chart that tracks the overall housing market. I'm in California. Maybe it's different by location too. Everything seems way overpriced right now. I wanted to compare the, the um, high prices I'm seeing to what they were one to 15 years ago. Okay, well, two things. 
I'm not really a robo advisor kind of guy. I still I do it myself. I you know have accounts at Vanguard and uh, Fidelity. Uh, I've I've had accounts at Betterment, Wealthfront, Wise Banyan, more to just test them, experiment with them, see how they work. But I still invest on my own. But I do think these automated investment services are certainly good options. And when I talk to young folks who don't really, you know, when I tell them, so, you know, do you know the difference between an index fund and an actively managed fund or asset allocation? Or, you know, you can just see their eyes start to go back up into their head and they're about to pass out at the coffee shop. And um, so hang on, hang on. Okay, that's okay. We got Wealthfront, we got Betterment. These are all good options. So I think they are certainly good options, uh, but I not options for me because I would prefer not to pay the 25 basis points or whatever the cost may be. All right, on to your question though, and that deals with pricing. So the Case Shiller has put out a, uh, they track um, uh, real estate values, you know, it, it, but it's at a very high level. And so if you're in a neighborhood, you want to know specific to your neighborhood or where you're thinking of buying, honestly, one of the great places to go to is Zillow. Zillow has great records. Uh, you can type in an address and it will show you. I typed in our address. It shows us the Zillow value. And again, it's, you know, you got to take that with a grain of salt, but it'll show you the Zillow value going back 10 years. And I saw that 10 years ago, Zillow had our, our house at valued at more than it does today. Uh, uh, so I'm not sure what that means. I guess we're here for the long haul. Um, again, take that with a grain of salt. I would say, uh, actually, the, Z- the Zestimate, as they call it right now, is significantly undervaluing our home. But we've done a lot of renovations that, that, that Zilla doesn't know about and so on. So, you know, it's, it's, it's not perfect. But I think it's a really great place to start, and it's a very easy tool to use. So um, you got Case Shiller kind of at a high level, by region kind of thing. And you can just Google that and you'll find it. Um, or Zillow. I think Zillow is a, a great, um, a great resource for that sort of thing. All right. On to the question of the week. Let's start with last week's question. So I, I mentioned the winners. I've already emailed uh, the four winners, uh, Dan, Michael, Ethan, and uh, Gina were the four winners. Congrats to you guys. And um, in looking at the, the, the net worth, I mean, they were all over the place. They, the, a, a number of folks had negative net worth. No worries there. You're tracking it. That's the start. When I graduated law school, we had a net, my wife and I had a negative net worth of 55000 and we probably didn't break even for, I bet, five years. We bought a house in year two, and then it went down in value you know, a year later. I bet we were underwater for several years in the house. It still had school loans. Uh, I graduated in 92. I bet we didn't break even until 97, 98. Um, so, you know, no worries there. Uh, and then it goes up. I think the highest net worth that I saw was 2 to $3 million. I'm just looking at it now, 76,000, um, 2.2 million. Uh, what do we got here? Um, 500,000. Some people, uh, by the way, didn't give me a number, and I told you that was fine. That was, you know, uh, the, you, you were still entered in the contest, even if you didn't give a number. Not, no worries there. But a lot of people attached spreadsheets, you know, the whole thing. Uh, some mentioned that they, a lot of people mentioned personal capital. I think a lot of people track the net worth and personal capital. Um, let's see what else we've got. Oh, here's a spreadsheet. Negative, negative 22,000, um, 160,000. Uh, some gave me like a progression. So one person gave me a progression over the last year or so that are 139,000. They've made great progress. Um, a lot of great responses. So I appreciate you sending that in. I'm looking at them now. Again, some people didn't give the number. I don't think I had anything over, over two, two to three million, I think was probably the, uh, the, the most. Here's why maybe two point oh they're, they're striving for two point five million. That's a good goal. Um, so anyway, uh, appreciate all those responses. And uh, if you're not tracking your net worth, please do. It's the scorecard. It's the scoreboard. It's you know, the budget. You know that's where all the tackling and blocking happens. You know, you you, you get your paycheck. You go to the grocery store. You put gas in the car. You pay your mortgage. You're bloodied. You're beaten. You look up at the end of the month at the scoreboard, which is your balance sheet, and it tells you how you've done. And if you spend less than you make, or you make more than you spend. Uh, that's going to improve your balance sheet, either because you're going to have more money in the savings account or you're going to pay down your credit card uh, debt and it's going to lower a liability. It's going to improve your net worth. And if you spend more than you make, it's going to lower your net worth. You're going to have to take money out of the savings account to make up the difference or you're going to charge up the credit cards. The balance sheet is, it's it's the scorecard. It's what tracks, you know, it's the scale. You know, if you're losing weight, you you jump on the scale and you you, you get the good news or the bad news. Well, uh, the balance sheet, your net worth statement, that's your scale when it comes to, f- to personal finance. So I highly recommend that you track it and that you track it over time. All right, the question for this week, and this is, I guess, the last one for the month, right? 
and uh, I, I've gotten a really good response. So I'm not sure we'll do it in December. I haven't thought that through yet, but it'll definitely come back. Uh, but this is the last one uh, for, for November. And um, so here's, here's the question. Here's what I'd like you to do to enter this contest. Again, I'm going to give away another four uh, $25 Amazon gift cards. Here's all you have to do. I want you to find an article, a calculator, a tool, a resource, something online. I guess an article is what I'm really looking for. It could be a news item, it could be a blog post somewhere, a story, whatever, about money that you think is worth sharing. It could be very educational, explain a concept, it could be funny, it could be inspirational, motivational. Just you read that article and you thought, yeah, this is, this is really good. And if I were going to share, share it with someone, this would be the article I'd want to share. All you have to do is copy the URL, paste it in an email to me at dr.doroller.net. You don't even have to say anything if you don't want. No commentary needed. You can just send me the URL if you want to. Um, and that enters you into the contest. It's as simple as that. I thought, you know, it's a great way for me to kind of see what you guys are reading, what, what you find interesting, what you find useful, helpful, motivational, inspirational. And, um, you know, I'll pick several, um, depending on what I get, but, you know, to share in the Facebook group and uh, to share next week in, in next week's podcast. But that's all you got to do to enter the contest this week. Uh, a great article, blog post, whatever uh, that you thought very helpful related. And it can be, I want it related to money, but, you know, beyond that, it could be anything. And uh, shoot me an email, drdoroller.net with that URL. And you're in the, you're in the $25 Amazon giveaway for next week. There you go. Well, listen, I hope you have a great week. And uh, until then, remember, the best thing money can buy is financial freedom.